shortness of breath, fatigue, swollen legs, rapid heartbeat. What does it mean when you show signs of one or more of these symptoms? Hello, I'm Dr. John White, WebMD's Chief Medical Officer, and you're listening to Spotlight On, a special series from WebMD's Health Discovered podcast. Today, we'll be talking about chronic heart failure, a condition that, if treated with the right health regimen, is nowhere near as scary as it sounds. Well, James, thanks for joining me today. Yes, thanks for having me. I was very excited to talk to you because I was reading a blog that you wrote recently, and I've got a quote from it that I want to ask you about. And you say, I was just your classic case of Mr. Unhealthy. I went to fast food places on a daily basis, drank soda, as we say in Michigan, pop, and too much beer. I had a sit-down job, didn't work out. And I smoked all on top of that. Absolutely. That was my life for about three or four years before leading up to my diagnosis. I just led a certain lifestyle. I would say the classic frat boy. I was, you know, in that world, there's what I call hyper-masculine behaviorism that exists where, you know, the men, we come together, we do everything in excess. So there was excess drinking, excess smoking, excess bad eating, everything bad in excess. Did you think to yourself then that it was bad and maybe unhealthy? It didn't occur to me at all because that was part of the culture, the social environment that I was involved with. That was the acceptability of behavior. And no one ever thought about their health. We just thought we would just endlessly live this reckless life of bad diet, bad habits, and just think, you know, we would be fine. But ultimately, as you know, your body catches up to you and it has a tolerance level And so such was the case with me eventually. Yeah. Tell us how your body caught up to you. What was that wake-up call, James? Well, the initial wake-up call was actually here in Michigan, of course. We're currently in winter season. So this was around the latter part of 2010. I was outside shoveling snow, and I noticed I was coughing up phlegm. Unbeknownst to me, I noticed that I left a trail of blood behind me, and I was one sign. Now, of course, prior to, I was excessively gaining weight. I had issues breathing, uh, sleep apnea. I had a lot of those classic signs. My legs were beginning to retain fluid, and I was having heart palpations. Uh, My heart would beat, you know, really excessively fast. And so, but ultimately, it was when that occurred that I thought something was seriously wrong. But before that, you had said to me and wrote, you thought all that was just allergies. (laughs) Was that just wishful thinking? Or what was going through your brain? I knew something was wrong with me, but I was afraid of the inevitable. I was afraid of going to the doctor, which I, and a key factor here is that I was not going to the doctor at all. I did not have an established primary care provider. So because I was afraid of going to emergency, I decided to go to the uh, local drugstore and I bought uh, cough suppressants and I bought decongestant, uh, you know, over-the-counter medications. And obviously none of those things was bringing about any type of remedy uh, with my condition. But it all came to a head when you needed to find out what was going on. Absolutely. Well, what ended up happening was that a family member recommended me to a primary care provider because at the time I didn't have an established health insurance. So there's actually places, as you are aware, that you can get service and they base it off income. And so I began going to this place locally and that's when uh, they did the EKG on me after I showed some visible signs of the breathing and uh, the weight gain and things of that nature. And then that's when my doctor at the time, my newly established primary care provider said, James, I I think you have heart failure, but I don't know to what extent the heart failure is. So at any point you feel you need to go to actual emergency and get emergent services, do that. Don't come to my office, you know. And she repetitively would say those things to me over and over again at every visit. It would be that same reminder to go to emergency. And ultimately, I did. What went through your brain when he told you that? Because you were thinking allergies, maybe something more. But I don't think heart failure was top of list. 
Even at that point of seeing the primary care doctor, it still didn't resonate in my mind what heart failure was to the extent I was totally ignorant about the condition. It didn't sink in until I actually went into emergency and actually saw an actual cardiologist. And that's when the cardiologist sat down with me and read the litany of diagnosis that he had given to me at that time. That's when I began to really take it serious and, of course, began to do my own research to learn more about these conditions. And I had not realized at that point how much damage I had actually done to myself. I was just really in awe and devastated at what I'd done to myself over the years. And what did they recommend for you? Well, initially, they had me on a lot of medications. I was on about 10 or 11 medications, plus an inhaler. Also, I began to see a cardiologist specialist, and uh, he suggested immediately to strongly consider getting a defibrillator or a pacemaker. And I asked him, what what's option B? I'm just curious. And he said, well, seldom do I recommend option B because most patients don't adhere to it. And I said, well, please humor me, mm-hmm. you know, because you're talking about putting a foreign device inside of me. So I'm just curious to know what's the alternate option. And he said, well, can you change? I said, how much time do I have to try changing? So he gave me a timeline, which is roughly about two months. He said, I'm going to allow you the time to make some adaptations to your life your diet and your lifestyle and things of that nature. And then we're going to revisit in about two months. That doesn't seem that long, two months. That's like 60 days. Exactly. (laughs) Right. Well, what did you have to do? Well, immediately, obviously, I stopped drinking the beers. I stopped going to the fast food restaurants and began drinking more water, eating more plant-based foods. I wasn't able to exercise at that point. My doctor didn't recommend that at that point. Um, I still had a little more recovery to do before that. But after revisiting, going back to the cardiologist, he did another EKG, and he actually found that there was a somewhat of improvement. Okay. And he said, you know, I like what I'm seeing. He said, so we'll table the defibrillator idea pending. You continue whatever you're doing, and then we'll do another follow-up visit and then see, you know, where we are at that point. So that then became my wake-up, ultimate wake-up call, you know, especially when I was able to exercise, when they um, allowed me to at least go out walking and things of that nature, uh, that really helped improve my overall health as well over a period of time. How much weight did you lose? Um, Actually, I was around 300 pounds. And you went down to as low as 195, correct? Yes, absolutely. And my doctor became a little concerned and she jokingly would say, you know, James, I don't want you to turn into a gray alien. She said, you know, I still want you to put some more weight on. You know, I don't want you to get too... uh, disappear on us. But she enjoyed my progress. She called me a classic patient. I became one of her favorite patients because I pretty much did most of what she asked me to do along the period of time. Mm -hmm. So she's been my doctor since my initial diagnosis. And you're on medication as well, Mm -hmm. correct? So, you know, I want to put in perspective, lifestyle certainly plays a role and can play a big role, especially if people can do it. Sure. But sometimes because of damage that has occurred over years and sometimes because of what people can do in terms of lifestyle changes, in heart failure, patients often need medications as well, maybe fewer and lower doses. Is that the case for you, James? Sure. As I began to make improvements, they minimized either the dosage amount or they just totally eliminated certain medications altogether. Um, And so moving ahead, because of the high blood pressure that has been pretty chronic in my life, and of course, I have a family history of high blood pressure, hypertension, my primary care doctor indicated that I'll probably be on at least one blood pressure medication for the rest of my life potentially, just because of that genetic connection with family history with it. So I've made a tremendous stride in terms of minimizing all of those medications based on just making simple changes in my life. We'll be back with more from James after a quick break. And now back to our interview with James. Now, this is an audio podcast, and I want to disclose to our audience, and it's okay with you, that you are a man of color. Yes. So, James, I want to ask you about whether you think race and ethnicity plays a role with your doctor. So, your doctor that you're currently working with is Hispanic. Does that help address some of the issues for you? 
Oh, absolutely. Mainly because of the cultural understanding. She's totally knowledgeable about the community I come from and a lot of the uniqueness in terms of um, the diseases and conditions that we experience as a community. Disproportionately, I always use that word disproportionate because a lot of like, especially heart diseases, you know, disproportionately, both men and women in my community suffer from that greatly. And so she's totally aware of all of that. And so that's what made her a little more concerning with me. I was 40 when I was diagnosed. And um, that was a reality that once I became more knowledgeable, she told me that, you know, in the African-American community in particular, the onset of symptoms, like such as uncontrolled blood pressure and, and diabetes, happens much earlier than uh, any other population or community of, of uh, peace or race of people. So being familiar with the community, like I'm in the city of Detroit, and obviously in the city of Detroit, there's a plethora of unhealthy places, you know, within miles radius of each other. And so she's aware of that community makeup, right? And so she's like, I understand, you know, environmentally what's going on in your community and how it might be difficult for you to be consistent with eating healthy. But she gave me ideas, you know, maybe not go to Whole Foods, for instance, you know, she said, but, you know, make little baby steps in terms of going to the general supermarket and just going around the produce section and, and learning about more about fruits and vegetables that way. This is a good doctor. Oh, absolutely. That, that you're describing. Yes. But you saw a lot of other doctors. Yes. What was your experience there? You know, there's been data in the literature that shows people of color are often diagnosed later with congestive heart failure because earlier on their symptoms might have been dismissed as, oh, they're not too serious, or, oh, they won't follow these recommendations. Mm -hmm. How has that played into your journey? Did you ever think that you were being treated differently? Oh, sure. Well, prior to the wonderful doctor I ended up with. What is that doctor's name? Dr. Marissa Abo. Okay. Yeah, I have to mention her. She's such a wonderful person. But uh, the doctor I was seeing, which was a brief visit uh, (laughs) prior to meeting her, He was very dismissive. In fact, he kind of treated me like a typical case study. You know, it wasn't an individual kind of approach, not really trying to understand my unique situation and how I became or got these uh, diagnoses or these conditions. It was just more so like he and and no eye contact either. It was it was a lot of the visits. He would just stare into his laptop. And I guess maybe he saw that I was African-American and just said, "Okay, African-American male. okay, congestive heart failure. man, okay, you know. It wasn't nothing personalized, you know, so I really didn't feel like a connection was there and that he really cared. You know, he just was kind of shifting me around and said, here's some medication. Take the medication as, as prescribed and I'll see you in three months. What's been the impact on family members and loved ones? Well, I have an interesting story and it deals with my father. My father actually passed away in 2014 due to congestive heart failure and diabetic complications, right? Now, my father watched me make all these tremendous strides and changes and shifts in my life, you know, while he was alive. And he was always amazed and he was like, wow, you really, you know, getting your act together. And that's great. But uh, my dad always struggled with making those changes for himself. And so um, ultimately when things went in the worst way for him. And he was in his transition stage. I remember him saying something to me and he said, you know, son, I watched you and you've gotten your health back. And that's beautiful. He said, obviously I didn't do that, but he said, son, in life, we all make choices and decisions. And ultimately we have to face the consequences of those choices and decisions, whether they be good or bad. And he said, and I've actually made mine. You know, he said, so don't feel bad for me. He said, it's, it's all about decisions, you know, hmm. but he wanted to encourage me to continue doing what I was doing, you know, because the one thing he keyed in on was that most men in our family don't live past 69 and he died at 69. So that became another goal of mine, if I will, to, you know, try to break that generational, if you will, curse um, and live a longer life. And yes, absolutely. Now, your diagnosis has changed so many things about you. It's changed how you look, how you feel, how you eat, how you exercise. But James, it's also changed your career. (laughs) So you started as a graphic designer. Tell our audience what you're doing now. 
Well, because of all my experiences with heart failure, after my father passed away, I decided I wanted to become part of something that was bigger than myself. Um, I was already doing little tidbits on my social media, but not really making an impact. So I decided to link up with the American Heart Association. In doing that, I became a local volunteer, did some television, radio. Then all of a sudden, I'm doing things on, with them on a national level. I'm actually, as a volunteer, attending scientific sessions, right? Um, also, they invited me to become part of scientific grant proposals uh, sessions. That's when the lights came on. Once I realized I had an acumen for looking at and studying basic science, uh, clinical science, population science, you know, and I'm looking at all these people that I would encounter at these meetings, all of them had NPH behind their names, you know, masters of public health, in addition to being medical doctors. So I knew it was some value, some value to that. Sure. And so through encouragement from some of those doctors and some of those professors, they said, James, you know, we're behind you. You know, if you want to pursue the NPH, I think it would be a tremendous compliment for you. And so I ended up applying to Purdue uh, University, where I'm currently in my last year. Wow. I have two uh, current semester and the next semester. And then, as you know, after the ending part would be me uh, doing my practicum. Sure. Yeah, so I'm looking at graduating uh, the fall of this year, actually, fall of 2023. Congratulations. That's terrific. Thank you. You're coming over to the public health side and, and helping educate everyone. Yes. Tell our audience how you're doing today. I'm doing great today. And you know why? Because not only do I have my health further under control, but I'm also, as we just talked about, I'm in my purpose in life. And I never thought I would be in this space. Never thought I would be in graduate school and pursuing a master's in public health. But uh, my life has become so much more purposeful now. People see me now because I've been doing this for the past six years. I'm like the heart guy. You know, even in my community, I'm the heart guy. And I like that. Where can people learn more about you and what you're doing? Well, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn under James L. Young II. Mm -hmm. I also have an Instagram page as well called James Heartbeat. Um, and there I post a lot of tidbits on general information about, you know, heart attack strokes and general heart health tips for people as well. And sharing of my advocacy work as well on there. So those are two places, main places you can find me. Well, James, thank you for sharing your story today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Joining me is Dr. Michelle Kittleson. She's professor of medicine and director of education in heart failure and transplants at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Dr. Kittleson, thanks for joining me today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. We talk a lot about heart attacks and patients know heart attacks. And I'm an internal medicine physician, but sometimes when we talk to patients about heart failure, they seem a little confused. And even the terminology makes it sound like it's imminent. So can you review for our audience, what do we mean by heart failure? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a better term than heart failure, because as you said, it sounds like someone is a ticking time bomb waiting for disaster to strike, is cardiomyopathy, which is disease of the heart muscle. And I like that term better. So if a patient comes to me with carrying a diagnosis of heart failure, the first thing I like to do is figure out does the diagnosis make sense? Do they have the cardinal symptoms of shortness of breath, swelling in their legs? And then the next question is, what's the root cause? There's about a hundred different reasons why a problem with the heart muscle could result in shortness of breath and swelling in the legs, and then disease-directed there can come from there. So I think the first step is exactly as you said, educate patients you are not going to die imminently, and let's now figure out the next steps. And what about the fact we're so used to connecting chest pain with heart disease? So, hey, I'm telling you, you have heart failure, but I never had chest pain. I'm just short of breath and I see fluid sometimes in my ankles or legs, but they feel like they're just getting older. So what about that presence of chest pain, which may or may not exist. 
That's a great point. And I like to think about five cardinal symptoms that could be a signal that there's something going on with the heart, whether it's the muscles, the arteries, the valves, the electrical system. And those five cardinal symptoms that should often direct attention towards the cardiovascular system are chest discomfort, shortness of breath, palpitations, lightheadedness, or fainting. And I think those five symptoms really encompass concerning cardiac-related problems. And so that's how I educate patients. You know, chest discomfort absolutely can be classic for one, but nothing is 100%. And then when you think about heart failure or cardiomyopathy, so the intrinsic problem, the major malfunction is the heart isn't pumping properly, and that results in fluid backing up instead of moving forward to the rest of the body. If it backs up in the lungs, you get short of breath. If it backs up in your legs, you get swelling. And that's the unifying explanation. You mentioned those five cardinal symptoms. I love how you say cardinal for those listeners that went to Catholic school were used to the cardinal sins, (laughs) which aren't necessarily the same, but they're serious. You don't have to have all of those symptoms, right? Exactly right. And they're not, I wouldn't call them a mortal or venial. I think cardinal, for those of us who went to (laughs) Catholic school, I I think cardinal is appropriate, but exactly right. That's a warning sign. Maybe you're perfectly healthy, but those are the five things that raise attention. There could be something going on with the heart, maybe the heart muscle, maybe the arteries, et cetera. Now, Dr. Kittleson, we know in heart disease, women sometimes present differently. We know that Sometimes when people of color present with the same symptoms as perhaps a Caucasian person might, they might treat it differently. It's not so serious. Can you talk about what we sometimes see in terms of the disparate treatment, even in terms of diagnosis? So maybe we can even start with how they might present differently with heart failure. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a combination of distinct biology as well as social disparities that result in the differential diagnosis and treatment of Black Americans with cardiomyopathy. The two most important biological pieces to keep in mind is, number one, hypertension is very common in Black Americans, and hypertension can lead to a cardiomyopathy, disease of the heart muscle, heart failure. The second very important condition to consider in Black Americans who present with heart failure is a specific form of cardiac amyloidosis that's caused by a gene variant. The gene variant is in fact present in 3% of Black Americans. Now, there's variable expression. So not everyone with the gene mutation or variant will get the disease, but it means that as a clinician, we need to have a heightened awareness for those populations. So that's the biology because they may be at greater risk. Some folks, their eyes might be rolling over as we're talking about genes and expression. But the bottom line is a certain percentage of the population is going to be at greater risk to begin with, partly in terms of their genetic makeup and how it's impacting their heart tissue and muscle. Exactly. And, And I think if you go through epidemiological studies, you will find that absolutely Black men have a higher risk of heart failure related cardiovascular death compared to white men. The same can be true for Black women compared to white women. That can be even a larger gap in younger versus older people. Rates of hospitalization can be higher. So all these things are true. Now, why they're true is this something we'll, we won't solve in this conversation? But I think the one thing we can do is say as clinicians, we need to have a heightened awareness of these specific issues and as patients to advocate. I have a rule. I have many rules on how to be a better doctor. And one of them is if a patient presents to you the second time with the same problem, the second presentation deserves a more in-depth workup. You might say you're fine the first time, but you're not allowed to say you're fine the second time without a more thorough in-depth investigation. And I think that's true for patients as well. I love that. I love Dr. Kilson, how you said your rules to become a better doctor. We're always lecturing patients how to be a better patient. Well, we have to focus on being a better doctor. When you think about diagnosis, you know, folks often can be confused because we have lots of different, you know, workup strategies for heart disease. We say, get on a treadmill, do these different tests. In heart failure, in some ways, 
we could say it's a simpler diagnosis, isn't it? In terms of the number of tests that you need to get done. That's a good point. I suppose as a heart failure specialist, I want to say it's a very complicated diagnosis. It is a complicated. (laughs) Years and years of honing my craft. And there's many (laughs) variants, but they may not need as many tests. How about that? They need the right test and you got to go to the right doctor to get the right (laughs) test and interpret it correctly. But there's a couple of tests that their doctor should be ordering if there's a concern for heart failure. 100%. I think the most important thing is if a patient presents with shortness of breath and or leg swelling, it is very reasonable to reach for an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, as the next test. It is non-invasive. It carries no risk, and it offers a wealth of information of cardiac structure and function that can then lead to the next steps down the line. We know that if the ejection fraction or squeezing of the power of the heart muscle is reduced, that is diagnostic in and of itself. If the squeezing power of the heart muscle is preserved, that may still indicate a cardiomyopathy warranting further investigation. Because there's different types. Some people can have what's called a preserved ejection fraction so that contracting is normal, but there's other things that are problems. I want to talk about treatment options because we've seen amazing advances in the treatment of heart failure even over just the last few years. So can you walk our listeners through what are those different treatment options? Because that's a success story. So people, we started off with, we're saying heart failure. That sounds like it's imminent. You know, how am I going to regroup? I, I failed a test, right? <laughs> or I failed something else. How am I going to regroup? But there's hope for many patients with heart failure today. So what's that hope based upon, Dr. Kittleson? Exactly as you noted, there are extraordinary advances in our understanding of the basis, the pathophysiologic hormones, neurotransmitters in the body that cause heart failure, which has led to pills that patients can take that can help them feel better, stay out of the hospital, live longer, and potentially even recover their heart function to normal. It's extraordinary. And it does take a partnership Mm -hmm. between the patient and their clinician, because when someone has heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, there are four essential pillars of medications that should be started in a stepwise fashion and then further titrated to achieve those incredible goals, feel better, stay out of the hospital, live longer, and potentially improve heart function. There are four pills that are incredibly important. And I try to tell patients, you have to balance the inconvenience of taking a pill with the extraordinary benefits you'll accrue down the line. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. So besides pills, sometimes patients require uh, pacemaker type devices. There's defibrillators and there's also what's called a biventricular pacemaker that doesn't require surgery to implant them. It's small incision in the chest area, a little device slipped under the skin, sometimes an overnight stay in the hospital. Those devices are incredibly important in conjunction with the pills. They're not useful alone. They're useful in certain situations after patients have been optimized on these incredible four types of medications to help the heart do well. And I think about the two devices very differently. Now, the defibrillator sits in the chest. It watches the heart, looks for a dangerous heart rhythm. If it finds when it treats it, it saves your life. It's like if you have a cardiac arrest and it shocks your chest and you live. So I think of it like an insurance policy. If you have an insurance policy, you don't necessarily feel different on a day-to-day basis, but it's there if you need it. Contrast with this other device called a biventricular pacemaker, same type of procedure, but it helps the heart beat in a more synchronized and efficient fashion. So certain patients with certain characteristics on their electrocardiogram and echocardiogram can be candidates for this additional bonus to the defibrillator that can help them feel better and live longer. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the impact on the quality of life. You know, we hear from patients how, especially early on in the diagnosis, it can be a real shock to hear those terms. And then a shock to understand um, the strategies that are needed to get their heart in a better condition. But what have you found is useful for patients and caregivers? Because there's often a caregiver involved when we're talking about heart failure as to how they can continue to have a high quality of life. You know, I think the first thing I always tell patients is we don't worry, we make a plan. Hmm. 
and we control everything that we can. So I often tell them, I can't predict where you're going to be 10 years from now. And anyone who says they are is lying to you. No one can predict the future that far in advance. Mm -hmm. But let's take where we are right now. Let's establish our goal, which is to help you feel better, stay out of the hospital, live longer, potentially improve heart function. If that is our goal, what is in our power to change to help you achieve that goal? So I think that's so important to frame. There is so much swirling and chaotic emotion around the diagnosis of heart failure, and I completely get that. But I feel that my role as the clinician, as the physician in the patient-physician relationship is to have the plan, the plan that will achieve the goal we want, and so that they can harness that emotion, that energy, to something productive and constructive. Let's give practical tips to patients, because let's put it out there. As you know, congestive heart failure, the number one reason why people are admitted over the age of 65 to the hospital. So there still is a likelihood that even when people do well, there will be episodes when they don't, and they'll be hospitalized. Never a fun experience. What can patients do? You talk about that plan with their doctor, but are there certain things they should be asking at each visit? Are there questions that that you'd say, hey, maybe you should ask this to your doctor to maximize your own health? Number one, am I on the best medications I can be on or are there any adjustments we can make that may help me do better? Mm -hmm. I think that's huge because there is such a power to these medications. Then lifestyle is important. I think number two, it's always important to ask your physician, what is your recommendation for exercise? How much is too much? How much is too little? What's my goal? And are there parameters? In general, the only restriction is common sense. If you're tired, you stop. You feel good, you keep going. But ask your physician that. Number three, are there diet Dietary changes that I should make that can make a difference. For some patients with heart failure, sodium restriction is hugely important. For others, it becomes less of an issue. So knowing where you stand on that continuum is very important. And maybe getting a consult with a nutritionist or something yes. else. Doctors aren't always the best in terms of actually telling you yeah. where sodium often hides in foods that we don't know. So that's a great point. Yes. Okay. And then always with over-the-counter drugs, you never quite know, is this okay? Is this not okay? And so the sort of there's a blanket term when it comes to patients who have cardiomyopathy or heart failure, that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the ibuprofen, et cetera, and naproxen type medications that are very effective to treat your headache, but can cause fluid retention and kidney problems. Ask your doctor, are there over-the-counter medications I should avoid? These are great tips. Dr. Kittleson, I want to thank you for helping educate us about what congestive heart failure is, how do you diagnose it, what might be some distinctions between men and women and and people of color, as well as what you should be asking your doctor. You have a new book coming out. Tell us about it. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's called Mastering the Art of Patient Care, recently published by Springer. It's pretty much everything I wish I knew in medical school, but didn't. You know, you learn best from your mistakes, but they shouldn't have to be your own. So I'd like every trainee out there, every young physician to be able to learn from my mistakes. And I cover topics such as how do you figure out the best specialty for you? What's it like being a woman in medicine? Men should not skip that chapter. And how do you have tough conversations with patients? What someone is angry or you're delivering bad news? How do you process bad outcomes? And to give people truly the joy in medicine that I've experienced. And they can learn to be a good doctor like you. Well, I'd say it's a learning process every day. Dr. Michelle Kittleson, thank you. Thank you so much. A big thank you to James and Dr. Michelle Kittleson for being part of our show today and to all of you for listening to Spotlight On, our special edition of the Health Discovered podcast. You can find more about James' advocacy work on Instagram at James Heartbeat. And be sure to check out Dr. Michelle Kittleson's new book, Mastering the Art of Patient Care. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer for WebMD, reminding you that better information leads to better health. Until next time.